OMG, like, totes welcome to my video. I'm, like, Agent Random, LOL, and, like, TBH. I am so happy that you decided to click on this video, LMAO. This is probably the dumbest introduction I've ever done. The world ends with you. You know it, you've played it, and if you haven't, get on that now. The World Ends With You series notably has a vast library of two whole games. The first of which released on July 27th, 2007, and the second on July 27th, 2021. Today is July 27th, 2022, making today the first anniversary of Neo and the 15th anniversary of the series as a whole. But while everyone in the world surely is celebrating the original game and the Neo game, I'd like to take today to remember a much more forgotten World Ends With You game. Hidden in the depths of the Square Enix dungeon, there is an obscure World Ends With You spin-off lost to time. When it was alive, it was only available in Japan, and it's currently incapable of being played by any sort of audience. No, no not you. I mean, yes, this is an obscure Japan-only spinoff that no one can play right now, but that's not what I'm talking about. I mean the World Ends With You Live Remix. If you've been a fan of this game for a while, you might have heard the name tossed around here or there. Its link is hanging out right there on the World Ends With You wiki. But most people still have no clue what in the world this game is, and I don't blame them. The wiki's info on it has been pretty sparse until pretty recently, and there's like one video about it online that actually has gameplay. Heck, I don't even think that I was totally sure what the game's deal was before beginning my research for this video. Live Remix's development began alongside Solo Remix, the port of the original game for mobile devices. Director Tatsuya Kondo wanted to implement some sort of social element into the game where you could interact and work together with other players. But as this feature grew and grew, it slowly became its own game altogether. And thus, Live Remix was born. This was potentially part of Square Enix's original Make a World Ends With You 2 grand plan. Similar Similar to what wound up happening later on with the near back-to-back -back releases of a Switch port of the first game, an anime adaptation, finally a freaking sequel, and a weird Japanese mobile spin-off, Square's original plan might have been to give the world Ends with you a Kingdom Hearts cameo, make solo remix, then live remix, and then like the world Ends with you 2 for the 3DS featuring Sugumi as a protagonist or something. But due to Square Enix's, uh... A general incompetence, that dream sort of stopped partway through. Live Remix itself saw Neku and all the other Nekus that hang out in Shibuya apparently group up in teams of up to 20 to do missions for a week. Team Neku would have a rival team of, uh, different Team Neku, and it was your job to make sure that your army of Nekus was better and got more points than their army of Nekus. A classic setup, red versus blue, good versus evil, Neku versus Neku. If you couldn't tell, this game takes place in an alternate universe from the main games. And thank goodness, just imagine what would happen if the main games had any sort of continuity issues. Unlike those main games, Live Remix wouldn't have a focus on narrative, but the game was still in need of a character that acted as a bridge between the player and the game. Someone to act as a tutorial and speak to the player whenever the game needed to tell them something. Someone that could ask the player to spend their last paycheck on microtransaction money. So Square opted to create a new character. A new kid on the block. A new child, if you will. Wait, I got it. And that was the birth of everyone's favorite trigger-happy splendiferous maniac with the appearance of a little girl. Wait, she's how old? Coco did wind up debuting in Solo Remix before Live Remix released, but that was only after her announcement for Live Remix. Her role in Solo Remix was exclusively to run a shop that would sell all of the game's microtransactions. But a really weird detail with her inclusion in Live Remix is that her sprites were actually animated unlike the sprites of any other character across the rest of the series. Her eyes blink, her finger waggles here, and even the ears on her hood wiggle around sometimes. I really like this detail and wish it were included in Neo or even Final Remix. Hopefully a future game gives it back to us. And that just about covers all the info that you can find about the game online. And seeing as my TARDIS doesn't work, my only way to get an idea of how the game was played was to hunt down the few English-speaking people who managed to play the game back when it was still with us in the realm of the living. So special thanks to Willow and Rabla for putting up with all of my live remix questions, and bonus thanks to Rabla for also proofreading this video's script. Rabla also provided the excruciatingly important info that one week after launch, he was a part of Team 15 and utterly demolished Team 16. This triumph 
Triumph was so powerful that it has now been immortalized in this video. But yeah, this video would actually have not been possible without these two, so links to follow them in the description. The game was structured as follows. A team's goal each week was to get more points than their rival team, and the best way to do that was to take out a ringleader noise, which was essentially a raid boss. However, your team needed a set of three ringleader fragments to unlock the boss. One red, one blue, and one green. Shibuya itself was divided into these three colors. No, this isn't a scramble slam. Each of these zones denote a route that a player could take through Shibuya. The green route was the 10-4 route, the blue route was the Miyashita Park route, and the red root was the Udagawa root. And you can only find a certain color of fragment in its corresponding root. So if you wanted a red fragment, you'd have to go through the Udagawa root. The more you fought enemies on a root, the more points you would get towards this treasure ladder and the reaper boxes within it. These reaper boxes would give you your fragments among other goodies. Once your team had managed to collect at least one ringleader fragment of every color, you could summon the ringleader noise. To fight the boss, that would cost the player 1 BP or battle point. Your BP would recharge at a rate of 1 every 20 minutes because mobile games. Alternatively, you could spend 3 BP instead of 1 before the encounter to boost your strength 3.5 times. Each time you summoned the boss, it would become more and more powerful. Eventually, it would get to the point where it would be near impossible to solo. As for the progression within the routes themselves, the game was not free roam like the mainline entries. You would progress from node to node with each district sort of being like a a world map. Because this was a free-to-play mobile game, moving to each node cost 2 AP, or action points. You would get 1 AP back every 3 minutes. There were two kinds of nodes, one with an exclamation point and one with a noise symbol. Stepping on an exclamation point node would give you EXP and TIP, which was your basic currency for the game. The noise nodes would result in one of two sorts of noise encounters. Either a basic noise fight, which involved the player swiping away some PNGs and calling it a day, or an assault noise battle, which the game treated more like a mini-boss. Assault noise encounters would also cost BP like a ringleader noise. Upon completing a zone, you would always be met with an extra assault noise battle. So if the final node was an exclamation point, you would be immediately thrown into an assault battle after getting your prize. And if the final battle was an assault noise, then another node would spawn after beating it with the real final assault noise. No matter what, you can't complete the zone without fighting one last assault noise. Combat in Live Remix was, of course, much more simplified than in Solo Remix. Similar to dive battles in Neo, the longer it took you to erase a group, the lesser of a rank you got and the lesser the rewards. Just like Solo Remix, you had a deck of pins with more being able to be collected as you played the game and gave Square that sweet, sweet microtransaction money. Pins were activated as you'd expect, tap, slash, etc. But unlike the main games, you didn't really control Neku's movement. He'd just sort of move around the battlefield as needed while keeping up with your pin inputs. Apparently you could sort of try to dodge enemies by taking advantage of how certain pins moved Neku. Like force rounds would make Neku take a step back, though those weren't really that effective. But if playing punching bag isn't your style then that's where overdrive may come in handy. Similarly to how fusions work, you would build up overdrive percentage and be able to unleash a fusion-like attack. The game also used an affinity system. Each pin and noise enemy was given one of three affinities, emotion, faith, and intelligence. This sort of thing should feel familiar if you've played these sorts of mobile games. Just like rock, paper, scissors, one beats the other. Emotion pins are strong against faith enemies, faith is strong against intelligence, intelligence beats emotion, yeah you get it. Each deck had three pins, and each pin had a cost limit instead of the original game's class limit. So if your deck had a max cost of 16, and you equipped a pin that cost 11, you could only then equip a pin that cost 5 or less. Additionally, pins also had rarities. Pins came in either normal, rare, super rare, or super, super rare varieties. There was also a fourth pin that your deck could contain, which contained a rental pin that you would borrow from one of your friend's decks. Additionally, there were two other decks, the skill deck and the support deck. I wasn't able to totally figure out what these did, but equipping pins in them seems to give Neku sort 
sort of passive abilities rather than letting you use the pins directly in battle. Also, the skill deck was not actually available at launch, it was added in an update. The more you battled, the more TIP you would get. This could be spent in a shop to get various cheap items like low level boosters or food to replenish your stamina. Because this free to play game with a large array of collectibles wouldn't be complete without a way to go broke collecting those items, this game had a gotcha system. While TAP was your common and grindable currency, the more premium currency that was really worth caring about were apples. And the pig noise acted as your glorified slot machine, which is pretty cute. You could encounter them in the wild or roll in special banners. Upon interacting with the pig, you would be presented with three options of apples to feed it. Green apples are free to use, but you weren't guaranteed to even get anything if you used one. The pig may just run away. Red apples were better and had low success rates for the good stuff. And rainbow apples were the ones to use if you were going for gold and wanted to have a solid shot at winning something worth bragging to your family about. However, the rainbow apples were pretty rare finds in game, so if you wanted to regularly use them, you'd have to write Coco a check. By playing the gacha, you had a chance to get not just every pin from the original game, but a whole slew of new pins. Some were unbranded, but many were part of live remixes to new brands. The two most obscure brands in the World Ends of You series. These brands were Mithril Scale and Maiden Innocence. Mithril Scale themed all of its pins around myths and monsters. You know, like dragons and stuff. While Maiden Innocence was focused on fairy tales. Snow White, Alice in Wonderland, and the like. These brands were some of the rarest and toughest pins that you could get in the gacha. A number of the live remix pins did eventually make their way over to Final Remix. However, they often had new names, new sykes, no branding, and pretty much retained nothing about their live remix counterparts aside from the pin design itself. That said, the green dragon pin from Final Remix still totally has the Mithril Skill logo on its design, so that's something. As for other rare pins, there were these pins with characters on them. These were obtained from character focused events. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a ton of info on these events, but it seems that they were the closest thing Live Remix had to a story since they came with cutscenes. There was a Shiki event that focused on Neku and Shiki, and some sort of beat event. These would see the player fight a special boss, and that's special in quotations because I'm pretty sure that they were just normal enemies. Upon defeating these bosses, you could get the character's pin. I can't be sure if there were events for them, but the game files do at least have character pins for Joshua, Karya, Uzuki, and Minamimoto, which could mean that these characters also had their own events or at least had events programmed in. There also do exist pin designs for Neku, Higashizawa, Konishi, Kitaniji, Hanekoma, and Koko used in an IRL pin gacha, so those may have also been in the cards to be added to the game. And then there was the Rhyme pin. Square didn't feel like Rhyme deserved her own event, I guess, and made her pin unlocked via a time attack mode. There was also a Mr. Mew pin, which reportedly could only be obtained via a promo code. These slips of paper apparently circulated on Yahoo Auctions Japan for years years even after Live Remix was beyond dead. And that brings us to now, where the game is beyond dead. The game didn't ever become that popular and was shut down after under a year of service. This, of course, was not Square's plan going in since they had already mentioned their plans for other expansions for the game. Aside from the other character events and their corresponding pins that I mentioned earlier, there were plans to add non-Nekus to the Neku army. Both Joshua and Beach were stated to be planned as playable characters. And not cheeky, I guess, because Square hates cheeky, I guess. I imagine that these were really just going to be skins for Neku that had a new overdrive attack or something and very little else. There were also plans for events where Uzuki and Karia would become game masters and where Sho would make some sort of appearance. Again, these are probably tied to their character pins. But oh well, none of it happened, what can you do? The only question that remains now is why info on this game is so hard to come by. Well, particularly, that's just what happens when your game is trapped in Japan. But it's actually a much deeper problem than that. The issue is with the lack of preservation. You see, the game was worked on by the developer Gree, since they were much more experienced with the mobile game market than Square was at the time. The game was hosted on their servers. And when I say that it was hosted on their servers, I don't mean that you had to connect to their servers to play online. I mean, basically, all the game's files were on their servers. Live Remix was fairly ahead of its time, and most phones just weren't built to run a game like it. Phones 
phones just didn't have enough file space for it back then. So when you played the game, it downloaded assets in real time from Gree servers and deleted them the second they were no longer in use. So even though an APK file of Live Remix definitely isn't impossible to find today, it's as good as useless since barely any game assets are actually stored in it. This mixed with Live Remix being a Japan-only game and the world under view being nicher than niche created a world where we're lucky that we even have the one gameplay video of Live Remix that we do. So yeah, this story doesn't really have a happy ending. A while back, a number of assets did somehow get leaked, giving us the sprites for the game's pins and brands and even some stat data for them. But other than that, Live Remix has remained an enigma, although Square seemingly hasn't forgotten about it. About a year ago, Square Enix released a Japanese survey about Nia, which many English Twitter users for some reason thought mentioned DLC when it's totally didn't, but it did mention Live Remix under the list of prior World Into View games. I wonder if one day this game or something like it will see the light of day again. Assuming that it was actually available worldwide, it would be in a much better position to stay alive for even a little bit and actually get preserved. Phones would probably be able to natively run it, and the world under view has a bigger community with people in it that would totally get on preserving it ASAP. The Field Walk RPG is proof of that. It similarly was a mobile game available for a limited time in Japan. And thankfully, it was documented, and efforts are being made to make it able to be experienced by English-speaking fans. That's the power of this community. It's really something special, and I feel honored to be a part of it. The World Ends With You is a game that means so much to so many people. It's a series filled with rich characters and stories that any person can identify with. Neku taught us to be more accepting of the world around us and to open ourselves up to other people. Rindo taught us to take control of our lives and make a brighter future. And Joshua taught us how to get away with murder. The point is, these games mean so much to all of us and to me personally. So I refuse to let any part of it face erasure and no longer be remembered. I hope this video acts as a sort of preservation for Live Remix so that it doesn't become forgotten. And if you're watching this and happen to have one of Grease server boxes chilling in your living room or or if you just have any other live remix info to share, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. I would love to learn and document anything else that I can about this game. Happy 15th anniversary, World Interview community. Keep being awesome. Huh, I wonder if there's any other anniversaries coming up. <laughs> Like a monster, step that thickness, they are that she dies. Like it's like a dungeon.